So good morning, everybody. This is uh, our last training session on gender issues, uh, which will be held by uh, Professor Deborah Scholart. Uh, and uh, um, we only have one more to go, which will be about uh, psychological support. Uh, so this meeting is being recorded, and I give the floor to Professor Scola, please. Uh, thank you, Raniero. Good morning, everybody. As Raniero says, I am Deborah Scollart. I am a researcher at the University of Roma Tor Vergata. And today we will spend some time discussing some main issues uh, related to the family law of Arab states. And then we will focus on two, two problems that we can face uh, among some societies in the Arab state, uh, they are connected to the status of women, and we will discuss honor crimes and bio domestic violence, violence against women in the, uh, with a focus on domestic violence. Uh, since I'm not aware of your competence, I know that there are students from all over the Mediterranean Sea, I have um, organized my speech um, by giving a short introduction to what Sharia is. Uh, in my opinion, it is important to know at least basic notions about Sharia because Sharia is the fil rouge that connects all the legal systems in the Southern Mediterranean, uh, especially among the Arab, uh, the Arab countries. Um, as you can see in this slide, we, we have some brief information we found two words, Sharia and Fiqh. And uh, the idea is that in, in contemporary language, uh, people use the word Sharia uh, in a very broad sense, in a very broad uh, meaning. And uh, in, in this broad meaning, Sharia encompass also the juristic interpretation on the sacred source of Islam. That is to say that Sharia is uh, usually um, uh, adopted as a general verb, as a general term uh, to make reference to the divine part of the law and to the human part of, part of the law. What is Sharia, strictly speaking? Sharia, as you can see here, is a, is a root, is a path, is a, is a street, we can say, that God has given to the believer, all the believer, um, Islamic, Islamic jurists, say that also uh, Jews and Christians have a Sharia, because Sharia is the law given by God. So it's, it's, a, it's a straight uh, set of rules given by God to the believers to rule and determine the proper way to act that, that the believer have, must, must follow in their human life. Uh, these rules are given by God in order to control the freedom of human being. A uh, human being, um, uh, they, they born, uh, they, they're born free, but this freedom is not absolute. It must be uh, limited for the sake of humanity. Um, in, in, this, in this specific meaning, Sharia as divine law, law given by God, uh, its sources are represented by the Quran, which is uh, the voice of Allah. It is uh, the, the, the parola, the, the, the word of Allah, and Sunnah. Sunnah is uh, the, the ensemble of the Prophet, um, Prophet Muhammad uh, way of life, its sayings, his behaviors, his silence. Uh, altogether, they, they create um, a set of rules that must be followed by whom? In this case, by the Muslim believers, because even if Sharia in its very broad meaning is the divine law for all humanity, Sharia Islamiyah is the divine law given to Muslims only, and it is open of also to people who believe in other faiths, but the main uh, subjects uh, to whom Sharia is directed uh, are Muslims. Uh, the Quran, as maybe some of, you, some of you certainly know, but maybe also those who are not Muslims maybe have some idea about the Quran. Uh, Quran consists primarily of stories, of narratives, of moral guidance, 
it was this wisdom, uh, education, and of, also of legal principles and rules. But the legal principles and rules are only a, a little part of the Quran. Uh, the, those who study uh, the sciences uh, related to Quran says that um, the Quran is composed of more than 6,000 uh, verses, 6,000 ayat. And uh, uh, among these six more than 6,000 ayat, only 100, more or less, are strictly connected with the concept of law. They, they specifically give rules to a human believer. This is why um, since the, the first revelation of the Quran and toward the end of the prophetic lifetime, uh, the individuals, the first Muslim believers, uh, began recounting the interaction with the prophet and um, they began to, to make reference to uh, um, the behavior of the prophets that contained religious instructions. Um, indication on indications on how to behave uh, in specific circumstances. The prophet was considered by the Muslims as a model and as a manifestation, so to say, of the uh, Quranic commands in practice, in, in the real life. Um, after the prophet's death, uh, the practice of making reference to the prophetic life um, uh, grew. Uh, grew over time, and we have the first collection of hadith. Hadith is a, um, is a, is the story, a single story related to the prophet. Uh, the collection of hadith appears in the in the early eighth century and become really rich and uh, full of uh, uh, details during the ninth century. Many many of these sayings of the prophets are useful as a source of legal instruction. That's to say, uh, through the hadith of the prophet, through the example of life of the prophet, we can better understand the meaning of the Quranic revelation. And because some of these uh, sayings or conducts of the prophet uh, can explain uh, in details the Quranic revelation. Um, uh, uh, to the purpose of considering uh, the prophetic life as an example for the followers, uh, the words and deeds of the prophets were uh, preserved, were collected by the companions of the prophet uh, in form of narratives, in form of hadith. And all the hadith together are, um, are known uh, under the name Sunnah. Sunnah in Arabic means tradition, but of course, in this case, it's not the general tradition, it is the tradition of the prophet. And Sunnah, together with Quran, are the main uh, basis, the main sources of Islamic law. That's to say that whenever a jurist in the past, as well as today, has to give, um, uh, uh, has to resolve, has to face a juristic problem, uh, the first step is to make reference to the Quran and the Sunnah, looking there for uh, an answer, looking there for an inspiration, at least an inspiration. Uh, if in the Quran or the Sunnah it is not possible, it is not so easy to find a, a, a proper and clear answer, uh, it is possible for the jurist to make reference to other sources of law. Uh, these sources of law, you can see them here, uh, are kias, which we can translate it as analogy, and ijma, which is the consensus. Consensus of whom? The consensus of the uh, community, of the community of the jurist. Uh, in the, mm, mm, in the study of uh, Islamic law, there is a difference uh, between the ijma al umma, which is the consent of the uh, whole Muslim community. Ijma al umma regards the, uh, the basic rules of religion, the faith in God, the faith that Quran was given by God and it is the word of God, the faith that Muslim, uh, that Muhammad is uh, the last of the prophet. And we have also an ijma al imma, which is the ijma, the consensus of the short community of jurists. Uh, that the, the reason 
why it is possible to make reference to the opinion of a short community of jurists is that in the Sunnah of the Prophet, in the tradition of the Prophet, we find a saying uh, in which the Prophet says, my community will never agree upon a mistake. So if there is a community uh, wider or, or um, shorter mm. of express their opinion uh, by virtue of their expertise. And yes, is an analogy, of course. Okay. Now you can see here, there is a representation of a tree. It is not an idea uh, of Deborah to represent the, represent the Islamic law as a tree. Uh, this idea belongs to Muhammad al-Shafi, who was a jurist of the second century of Islam, uh, who is known as being the person who has um, given a structure to the Islamic law. Why a tree? Because this tree has some roots in Arabic, Ozul al fiqh the roots of jurisprudence, and the roots are four, the four we have already seen, the Quran, the Sunnah, the Qiyas, and Ijma. And all these roots come together to, um, to form some branches. The branches of law, for al fiqh in Arabic, the branches of law in the Islamic traditional perspective are mainly devoted to two main subjects. On one side, we have the Ibadat. Ibadat are the acts of worship, and they regulate the vertical relation between God and uh, the creatures, human beings. Ibadat are, of course, the prayer, the rules on the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, the rules on the fasting, and so on. And in, in, the, in the ancient manual of Islamic law, uh, all the ancient manual of Islamic law opens with the description of the rules of Ibadat. Because in the Islamic perspective, Ibadat are rules, juridical rules. And then we have uh, the Muamalat. Uh, I translated in, in Italian, they will be negozi juridici. In, uh, I couldn't find a better translation in English, and I said the Latin expression negozia. Muamalat are the horizontal, uh, relates to the horizontal relations between human beings. Muamalat are marriage, uh, contract, sale contract, or um, whatever contract you have in mind. Uh, Muamalat is divorce, the rules on uh, affiliation, some Islamic criminal rules. That's to say, uh, the branches of law are, 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 are finalized to, to rule um, almost every field of human life. I say almost because in the Islamic legal tradition, in the classic Islamic legal tradition, Muamalat does not involve what we call today public law. We don't have uh, Islamic rules that govern the, the form of state, for example, or uh, what kind of government you have to, de you have to, uh, to live in, or uh, what are the structure, the main organs of a state. Public law is not typical of a field of Islamic law. Islamic law deals with the relation between single human beings or between Co um, religious community, the relationship between Muslims and Christians, Muslims and Jews, Muslims and um, polytheists. Okay. Now, um, what is the purpose of Islamic law? Uh, the purpose of Islamic law is to give a definition of human conduct. This definition is always based on Sharia. Please remember that Sharia is the uh, is, is the divine law given by God to humanity. Through what? Through fiqh. In fiqh is an art, is a science, is a method, is a, is a science. In, in the classic legal text, we find the word uh, ilm, science, that we can also translate as art. It is an art, um, uh, used to say Ibn Khaldun, in this improper translation of its speech, uh, it's an art of taking from the roots of Sharia a qualification of the conduct of human beings following the, uh, the sh Sharia uh, concept of what is right and what is wrong. And this uh, art of qualification, uh, the, the conduct of human beings, uh, can be organized into five different uh, notions, uh, which are very well known to almost everybody. We have acts that are mandatory, acts that are forbidden, recommended, reprehensible, and free. Now, usually when I, when I 
give my lessons in, in Italian to my students. This is the point of the lesson when I ask to the students, can you give me an example of mandatory action for a Muslim believer? I don't know if there is if there are students connected and if they won't take take the floor. So does anybody want to try to tell me an example of mandatory behavior for a Muslim? Uh, pray, praying five times a day. For example, yes. Yeah. And usually what happens usually is that everybody, well, of course, the Muslims are well aware, but the non-Muslim also usually quote as example of mandatory conduct, um, almost everybody in the world knows that, as you say, Tulai, uh, a Muslim believer has to pray five times a day or he has to fast during a specific month or he has to do the pilgrimage to Mecca. So it is correct in the legal tradition of Islam uh, ibadat are legal rules, so an example of mandatory legal rules is uh, uh, the prayer. An example of forbidden conduct, something that the Muslim cannot do, and if they do it, they will be punished for it. I think that to lie is your duty to speak because <laughs> I don't see anybody else. Well, actually, actually, we are having Aysun right now, and uh, she's a theologist. Oh, and wow. uh, she's um, a German born, a Turkish and German educated. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, here, here ah, she is. Hi, so I well. think she <laughs> is the one who has to speak. Okay. I so see. Give, your... give us an example of forbidden act in the Islamic legal tradition. Well, drinking, Hello, ladies. drinking wine. Yeah, drinking alcohol. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really sorry. I'm actually at fitness. I didn't know from that um, from that uh, teaching. I'm really sorry. So I'm just <laughs> running all time. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yes, uh, drinking, nice having alcohol. Or, sano. <laughs> yeah, great. Or giving, we can give a Jewish um, uh, forbidden uh, act as well, or um, having sex before marriage yeah. is forbidden as well. Exactly, exactly. And uh, even in this case, when I ask the question to my Italian students, they usually reply, Muslims cannot drink wine, they cannot eat uh, pork meat and, and this kind of answer. Uh, more difficult for those who are not Muslim or who are not, um, who have not a great knowledge about Islamic culture is to identify recommended or reprehensible uh, example of conduct. In this case, I will ask if uh, Aison is available to, to give us some answer. Otherwise, in, in, uh, in ordinary lesson, it is my duty to give an example because Italian students who are not Muslim are not usually they are not able to answer to the question related to recommended uh, mandub or croh uh, behavior. Aison, would you give us some example or would you like that I, 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 I do it? No, it's okay. Uh, um, for instance, a brushing the teeth. Yeah. Um, you can use the miswak according to the sunnah of the prophet. This mm -hmm. would be recommended, but if not, you're allowed to do it with the regular uh, teeth brushing uh, instruments as well. Yeah, yeah. And usually I give like, as, a, as an example of recommended act, the marriage, because marriage is considered, was considered by the Islamic legal tradition as a way to um, to avoid fornication, as a way to uh, to rule uh, the sexual uh, interest of human beings in order to avoid fitna. Fitna is chaos, is confusion, is mess. And all the legal system, and the Islamic legal system is one of these, uh, have as one of their main purpose uh, to avoid confusion, to avoid chaos, to avoid uh, uh, fight among the people. Now, a recommended example is marriage. A reprehensible example is talak. Talak is a repudiation, is the unilateral way of dissolving marriage. Unilateral because it is an instrument, talak is an instrument uh, given by law only to men. Uh, women can ask for divorce while men can simply uh, cut off uh, the marriage with a declaration. Why it is reprehensible? Because even if in the Quran we find a lot of, a lot, we find some verses that give a discipline of talak in the Sunnah of the Prophet, so in, in one of the sources of law, in the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, we found that the, the Prophet once says, among the permitted things 
by God, uh, Talak uh, is one that dislikes uh, God, is one that does not make God happy with human beings. So uh, Talak Repudiation is an institute that uh, men, Muslim men can, can use, they have at their disposal, but they cannot abuse of this uh, opportunity. And then there are also uh, Mubah, free, free act, uh, those acts that have no kind of uh, relevance in uh, the realistic point of view. Now, um, all this, um, all, all, all the relation, the connection between uh, the Sharia as human, as divine law, and the fiqh as the human interpretation of divine law has created all over the centuries a system, a very complex and sophisticated system of law that has been applied to Muslims almost all over the Islamic world uh, with some differences. These, difference are, these differences are uh, the result of um, uh, some uh, different approach to the use of sources of law, uh, even though the sources are um, recognized by all the jurists, Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, and then he asks the different relevance of these sources uh, gave life to some uh, uh, to, to a different approach uh, to the law. And uh, the different approach to the law creates uh, different schools of law, uh, which are known by the name of the main uh, students, by the name of the eponimo, uh, the, the, the founder of the school. This is why we speak of Islamic law, Islamic Sharia, uh, interpreted by the fiqh of Abu Hanifa uh, or by the fiqh of uh, Malik Ibn Anas or in the Shia world, uh, Islamic law in the Jafari school of law. Uh, the, the main concept, the basic rules are common to almost everybody in the Muslim world with some differences that can become significant in certain fields based on the, uh, on the uh, uh, different use and relevance given not to Quran and Sunnah, because Quran and Sunnah are the main sources to everybody, but based on the different relevance that can be given to analogy, ijma, and even other sources of law like Darura or Maslaha. Uh, Darura and Maslaha are, uh, are instruments that are, can be used easily by jurists that belong to Hanafi school of law. Uh, darura is the necessity rules. Uh, in case of necessity, even something that is forbidden can become allowed. The typical ex example is uh, if you are lost in the desert, you don't have uh, water and you find someone that is a merchant of wine and the merchant of wine can only offer you a glass of wine in order to have something to drink. Well, in that case, because there are no alternative or you drink wine or you die, then in that case, for the school who allow the... Uh, the role of darura, the role of necessity, in that case you are allowed to drink only as much wine as it is uh, sufficient to hydrate your body, if we can say so, so you don't have to, to uh, take chance of the opportunity and uh, get drunk, of course. But it is clear that if a school allows the concept of Darura and another school does not allow this concept, the result in the, in the interpretation of the specific con, um, conduct can be very, uh, can be opposite because the same conduct of drinking wine can be haram for some jurists and in that specific case considered allowed by others. Uh, this, Deborah, can, can give, I ask you a question? Yes. Under this respect, uh, I, I have heard uh, because um, we often, uh, uh, you know, have lunch with, with uh, Muslim yeah. people. And in some cases they say that if you don't know that, for instance, in a certain dish there is pork meat. Yeah. And you eat that. If you don't know, then it, it is, is not. It is not a thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's true. It's, it's correct. It's true. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Because what, what, what the law, what the Islamic law wants to prevent is the... Um, Willing, willingly violation of the orders of God. If you don't know it, you are not a sinner, okay? And th th these are general rules, which, is, which can be applied in, in different way by the schools of law. In this, in this map, you can see the broad extension of the Hanafi school of law. Uh, why, why, why this school has, uh, has had this great success in uh, 
spreading uh, their um, their attitude toward law. Uh, if you compare the Anafi School of Law, for example, with Hanbali School of Law, which is the red red circle in the Pen Arabic Peninsula, um, the different capacity of um, spreading of lo all over the world is based on the different approach toward the sources of law. Since Hanafi School of Law, of course, moves from Quran and Sunnah, that's it. Everybody must start from Quran and Sunnah. But the Hanafi School of Law uh, also allowed the Rai, which is the uh, personal, personal reasoning of the jurists. They allow Darura, necessity. They allow Maslaha, which is the public interest. They have been able to, I will say, adapt, to adapt to the different context, social context, uh, that Islamic meet, uh, meet during its uh, expansion toward north, south, east, and west. On contrary, Hanbali jurists make, uh, make a great use, make um, reference uh, mainly to Quran and Sunnah, and they tend to qualify as voided all the conduct that are not allowed by Quran and Sunnah. As a consequence of this approach, and as a consequence of the fact that Hanbali School of Law uh, is very strict and rigid in recognizing to the jurist the possibility to use its individual mind, its individual reasoning, the Hanbali School of Law has not been able to spread um, in, in, uh, extra, uh, in extra lands apart from the land where it was uh, born. That's to say the Arab context, the specific Arab context of um, um, the jazz, the Mecca and Medina area where the school uh, was born. It, the difference is based on the, uh, it's properly based on the different approach of the jurist toward the sources of law. As much as the sources of law are flexible, they consent to the jurist to, um, first of all, adapt to the different concept, uh, um, land and um, framework where they have to operate. And the second, which is very interesting, in my opinion, is very interesting, to allow um, so, uh, legal rules uh, that were born in different legal system to enter the Islamic law. Uh, when, when the Muslim society, uh, the first Muslim society, move from Mecca and Medina uh, toward north, toward the Mediterranean, they faced the Byzantine um, the, uh, Byzantine Empire and they faced the uh, Persian Empire. And the jurists were able, during the time, of course, it was not a, a process of a couple of days, it takes a century, but they were able to um, to allow rules coming, some rules, not all the rules, some rules coming from the Persian and the Byzantine empires into the Islamic legal system based on the notion that everything that is not in contrast with Sharia can, be, can become part of the Sharia itself, Sharia in its broader meaning, of course. And this is why Islam has been able to uh, spread uh, in almost uh, uh, every, every part of uh, the, um, uh, the world, because as you can see here, now Muslim world is, is uh, made of, uh, I think there are uh, 52 or 53 countries almost all over the world, due to this capacity, to this ability to uh, adapt to the context. It, it, uh, adapt does not be um, um, intended as, um, a renunciation uh, to its own values, but only uh, must be intended as a capacity to um, uh, allow other um, rules, other way of uh, life in the Islamic practice. And this is why you can see, for example, uh, I think a lot of, of you has been able to travel before the COVID uh, all over the world. This is, why, this is why we can see different way of being Muslim all over the world. Uh, people from Algeria are different from people in Indonesia and Indonesian people are different from Muslims of Afghanistan or Iran. All of them are Muslims, but their difference are based on this attitude of the Islamic law and Islamic theology, but this is not my field, field to, uh, to embrace different culture. Now, uh, this, this very short and 
general introduction on Sharia, um, give us the chance to uh, start speaking about the, um, the Islamic family law. Uh, as, as I say, uh, as I said at, at the beginning of this conversation, uh, almost all the Arab countries, I, I will say almost all the Islamic countries, an exception is Turkey, of course, but almost all the Islamic countries in the field of family law, um, even today, are um, strictly based on the principles and rules that we found in the traditional Islamic uh, idea of family. And in the Arab states, this is particularly particularly true. As I said, Turkey is a, an exception to this trend. Um, in the contemporary Muslim family law, uh, uh, the state have, have chosen to um, be faithful to the Islamic tradition. And even though they have uh, proceeded to codify the family law, and this process of codification uh, usually started uh, with the independence of the Arab states from uh, France or England or whatever, um, even though they have chosen to codify the family law um, as, a, as a manifestation of the power of the state to give the law to the people, they have also chosen to, uh, to maintain strict, uh, strict liaison, strict uh, uh, reference to the Islamic tradition. Uh, there are, of course, some differences. In some cases, the legislator has been able to uh, introduce significant reform. Uh, in other cases, the legislator have been uh, uh, very shy uh, under this respect. And uh, making reference only to Arab world, uh, we have two different, two, two main, main point of reference. On one side, we have Tunisia, uh, which since 1956, the year of codification has prohibited polygamy and has prohibited the talaq repudiation <clears throat> on one side. On the other side, we have Saudi Arabia, which today is the only Arab state that have not codified the um, family law. And between Tunisia and Arabia Saudi, Saudita, uh, Saudi Arabia, we have all the other countries with different attitudes toward codification and toward the reform. Generally speaking, the countries on the Mediterranean, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, they, they show a major attitude toward reforms. They are more um, inclined to, um, uh, to adapt the law to the changing society. While in the Arabic Peninsula, uh, the legislator, first of all, the legislator uh, decided to codify family law uh, quite late. Uh, the um, personal status code in the peninsula, in the uh, Arabic Peninsula, dates at the beginning of this century, of the 21st century. And secondly, when they codified the family law, um, they choose not to introduce any kind of reform. They are quite consistent with Islamic traditions. We can say that the um, personal status code of the Pen Arabic Peninsula are uh, nothing more, more than a transcription of traditional Islamic rules in the form of a, of a legal text. Okay? Uh, the essential features of the family uh, law in, uh, in the Arab world, in the Islamic world in general, and in the Arab context in particular, can be represented by this this scheme that you will see here. Uh, first of all, we have to point out that um, the Muslim law of marriage uh, is influen was influenced, dates back to the customary law of Arabs before uh, the Islamic revelation. Um, why we say so? Because we see uh, in, uh, in the structure of the Islamic family, a lot of um, elements, a lot of uh, examples of um, idea of family which is based on patriarchal concept. Mm -hmm. the, the, Islam, the traditional Islamic family, this is not only the case of Islam, of course, but we are speaking of Islam, the traditional Islamic family is a patriarchal family with a, uh, with a man uh, uh, granted of much more freedom, uh, respect the woman. Now, 
Um, the marriage is a contract in the Islamic legal tradition and even in the law of contemporary Islamic states and Arab states in particular. It is a contract concluded uh, between the bridegroom and the bride's wali, wali al-Nikah. Uh, wali al-Nikah is a guardian of the woman. And this first, uh, um, this first element shows you that, um, generally speaking, uh, still today, in, uh, in most of Arab world, woman is not allowed to enter a marriage by herself. She needs to be uh, assisted by a tutor, a guardian, a male tutor, which is known as Wali al-Nikah. This Wali al-Nikah must be a free Muslim, he must be an adult, and uh, he, he, he must be, um, um, how do you say, uh, uh, intellectually sane. Now, the wali can give the bride in marriage only with the consent of the bride, but in traditional legal system, and this is one of the rules that has been changed at least on the, in the countries that faced on the Mediterranean, uh, the, uh, these rules, the rule that in the case of the virgin, silent consent was sufficient has been now uh, corrected by the legislator. It, is, it, uh, it can still be found, this rule of silent consent of the virgin uh, in some codes of the Arabic Peninsula. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are different uh, duties uh, on, uh, placed on uh, men and women um, uh, as a kind of equivalent for the rights which the husband acquires over the wife. Uh, the man has to give the wife a brother lift, which is called mahr, and in, in, uh, in the Maghreb we, you can also find the word sadak. And it, mahr is an essential part of the contract. It is uh, the, the um, you say in English, the corrispettivo. It is the counterpart of sexual relationship. The wife allows the husband to have a sexual relationship with her, and as a compensation for this authorization, uh, the husband has to give the mahr. That's what, what I want to say. That mahr is uh, um, uh, must be given to the woman. If you if you found in any society that the mahr has been given to the father of the girl, for example, or to her brothers, or this is not Sharia. This is customary law, and it is anti-Islamic. It's not it's, it's not Islam. It cannot be said that this is Islam because in the Islamic legal tradition, mahr is must be given to the woman as a as a. I can't remember the English term, I will say it in Italian, corrispettivo. Uh, um, compensation. As a, as a price, think, yes. I think a compensation for, is a good word. Right, right. Uh, for the sexual uh, availability of the woman. But of course, marriage is not only sex against uh, money, because otherwise it will be prostitution. In the marriage, we have something else. And we have... In, in, uh, um, as a duty of the husband, nafaka, which is the, the duty to maintain the, the wife, he has to pay for the house, for the dress, for the food. And also, this is a duty uh, that, that is in charge of the man, because the man in the traditional legal system has a general capacity of protect women. As a, as a counterpart for nafaka, for maintenance, uh, the wife owes the husband obedience. Now you can see that we have two different set of obligations. Uh, on the man must, the man is obliged to what we can say are financial obligations to pay the mahr, to pay the nafaka, the maintenance. While the woman is in charge of personal obligation. She has to accept the sexual relationship with the husband and she has to accept to be a wife in the traditional patriarchal way of uh, understanding the concept of wife, cleaning the house, preparing the food, um, taking care of uh, domestic environment and such like this, and also accepting the authority of the husband over her. Because in the, in the Islamic tradition, which, as I said before, uh, reflects the patriarchal idea of society, and as I said, uh, patriarchy uh, is not an Islamic uh, character. You can see patriarchy almost everywhere in the world, but in this specific case, uh, patriarchy is 
uh, in, in a way connected to religion. And this is why it, it is a little bit more difficult in the Islamic environment to uh, make reform in this in this uh, in the field of your family law, because it is possible for the conservative parties of the society to find in the Quran some arguments uh, toward the conservation of the structure of family with the man as a head of the family and the women and children uh, subordinated to his authority. Now, um, there are some impediments. Uh, to, to the marriage in the Islamic legal tradition. Uh, these impediments are, are relevant and I will just focus on them because this argument is also interesting in view of uh, the discussion on domestic violence and uh, um, honor crimes. Uh, it is not possible to marry some, some member uh, of the society. These members of the society are, first of all, blood relationship. Uh, that's to say that a man cannot marry his female ascendants and descendants, his sisters, the female descendants of his brothers and sisters, and he cannot marry his homes and great homes. He also cannot marry foster relationship um, based on the Quran. Uh, those who have taken milk by the same woman, there is not, well, today we have the artificial milk, so the problem is um, uh, reduced in its impact over the Islamic society. But when there was not artificial milk, it was possible to, uh, to rent a woman to give milk to the babies. Uh, this, uh, this activity uh, gave life to the so-called foster relationship. And those who suck the milk from the same woman were considered brothers and sisters, and they cannot marry each other. And then we have the relationship by marriage. That's to say that a man cannot marry his mother-in-law, his daughter-in-law, his stepdaughter, and he cannot marry together two sisters or an aunt and a niece together. All this person, blood relationship, foster relationship, and relationship by marriage are considered in Arabic maharim. That's to say people who cannot be married, maharim. And of course, I, I, I describe the situation on the prospect of a man who cannot marry women, but it is too also the reverse. A woman cannot marry her brother and father and blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, this concept of maharim will be uh, useful uh, later on in this uh, conversation. Uh, there are also some other impediments to marriage, and some of them are quite interesting. One of these is the Existence, existence of a previous marriage, uh, as almost everybody knows, uh, a woman can marry one man per time, while a man uh, can, in the Islamic legal system, can marry up to four women at the same, uh, can be, can have up to four uh, wife at the same time, <clears throat> and. I lost the connection on the internet when I was speaking of polygamy. While in the Arabic Peninsula, there are mainly no reform on, on the possibility for a man to marry more than one wife, even without advising all the wives that they are entering a polygamy, a polygamic marriage. On the Mediterranean Sea, we can face a lot of reform, apart from Tunisia and, of course, Turkey, but Turkey does not, is not relevant because a Turkish legal system is not Islamic at the moment, so I will not make reference to, to Turkey under this point of view. So apart from Tunisia, uh, which has declared polygamy uh, void and sanctioned by uh, criminal law, uh, the other countries have uh, maintained the possibility uh, to, for a man to enter polygamic marriage, uh, but introducing, while introducing some limitation. For example, the husband has to demonstrate that he can allow uh, he can maintain more than one wife. He must demonstrate to the judges, to the family courts, that he has informed uh, the actual wife and the future wives that they are entering a polygamic union. And um, this, this attitude of the legislator is interesting because it is a way to, uh, to uh, keep the Islamic rule that allows uh, polygamy while uh, in reality, restricting uh, the opportunity because, as all women know, when a man faces something that is too much complicated, he tends to avoid to enter uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the project. If it is 
to have too much documents i have to go and and demonstrate and discuss and show anyway this is a way to limit polygamy without making it void or without declaring it impossible and it, this strategy uh, consent to the legislator to um uh, to keep uh, at least a, a surface of um, uh, Islamic conformity of the legal rules. Now, um, another limit, and this is more relevant to the life of person, another limit to uh, the marriage is the difference of religion. As maybe most of you know, uh, it is impossible in, in the Islamic legal systems, in the, uh, the Islamic legal systems, with the exception of Turkey once again, and Tunisia since a couple of years, it is impossible for a Muslim woman to marry a man who is not Muslim. On contrary, it is normally uh, allowed for a Muslim man to marry a woman who belongs to the so-called Ahlal Kitab, that's to say the uh, monotheistic uh, believer, uh, Muslim women, Jewish women, Christian women, even though uh, we have to say that in the Shafi school of law, the possibility for a man to marry a woman who is not Muslim is uh, surrounded by such restriction that it becomes almost impossible. Uh, Indonesia is not part of the MENA region, of course, but for example, Indonesia, uh, which is a country whose family law is based on the Shafi school of law, um, uh, officially said in the law that as well as it is prohibited for a Muslim woman to marry a man who is not Muslim, it is prohibited to a Muslim man to marry a woman who is not a Muslim. So it is uh, an exception to a general trend that in the other Islamic countries uh, allows a man to marry women belonging to Ahla Kitab, belonging to the great monotheistic religion. Um, in the classic Islamic law, we don't have any reference to the minimum age of legal marriage, and this has been and still is a problem in some part of uh, the MENA region, uh, because in some, some area of the MENA region, it is possible still today to, um, uh, to see uh, marriages with uh, especially girls very young, with baby girls. Uh, one of the country where this phenomenon is more spread is Yemen. Usually we can see that the um, uh, children marriage are, are spread uh, generally in context where there is war or social in, uh, instability. Uh, in, in, the Islamic, in the Islamic world, uh, children marriage are, are, are present in significant numbers in Yemen, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, countries which have um, a story of uh, instability, if we, and in Somalia also, uh, of, sorry, of instability, if you want to use a um, soft term, which dates back uh, over years. Uh, the problem of the minimum age for marriage is a problem still today. Once again, in the Mediterranean area, the legislator uh, have chosen to regulate uh, the, the question and they've fixed the minimum age uh, for men, uh, for male and female. Usually this minimum age um, uh, goes from 15, 16 up to 18 or 21. And in, uh, in um, many countries, in the recent reforms uh, that have taken place in many countries in the Mediterranean region, we found the same minimum age for male and female, which shows a trend toward the parification of legal position of men and women in the society. Once again, in the Arabic Peninsula and in, um, uh, in the more and in uh, area of the uh, Islamic world which are um, far away from us, let's say Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, it, is, um, it is possible to find uh, in the laws um, or the absence of limit, it is not specified which is the minimum age of marriage, or it is indicated as a minimum age of, age of marriage and an age uh, which is not so, so nice because it is allowed to marry uh, boys and girls who have 10 years or 11 years, they are really children. This is a problem. It is one of the, the uh, 
elements of Islamic family law that today shows the greatest difference between different parts of the Islamic world. Now, um, as you can see in this slide, the man alone has to bear the expenses of, in the Islamic concept, has to bear the expense of maintaining the household, and he's obliged to support the wife um, uh, in, in all the expenses for her, for her life, so the house, the, the food, dress, and so on. Uh, the rule of maintenance, the rule that makes, make, creates a relation between Nafaka and Isma is still present in those legal systems that still today declare the man as head of the family. When you find in the code that the man is defined, as it used to be, for example, in Italy until 1975, that the man is head of the family, it is on, in charge of the man to maintain uh, the family. When you, you find a, a reference, like for example in uh, Tunisia, but also in Morocco after 2004, uh, to the fact that both um, husband and wife plays the same role in the family, in that case, the duty of maintaining the wife is reduced because the woman has gained uh, responsibility inside uh, the family. Now, the problem of the relationship of men and women and of the duty, the possibility for the man to correct or to, to impose its uh, will on the, on, on the wife uh, is a problem that has been interpreted over the century and still today uh, taking some, some aid, so to say, uh, from a specific Quranic verse, a verse that is uh, the verse uh, 34 of the Surah 4. Um, the model of Islamic family law, uh, as I said, is a patriarchal uh, model, and the roles of men and women are quite distinct. The man bears the burden of maintaining and protecting the family, and the woman has the duties of caring, off the, caring for the offsprings and managing the, the, the family. Um, as I said, this structure is described in, term, in terms of Nafaka and Hizma. And in the, in the idea of Hizma, as you can see, are included uh, the physical cohabitation. And physical cohabitation must be understood, uh, understood as communion of life and as tamkin. Tamkin can be translated as sexual submission of the woman to the man, and also to, as, as commitment to a domestic care. Now, the problem of this verse and the problem of the personal relationship between men and women is that in, it is possible to find, uh, even in contemporary Islamic uh, jurists, an attitude, which is not a general attitude, but is an attitude, to uh, read this uh, Quranic verse as an instrument that allows men allows specifically husband, but generally speaking, allows men to correct women and to correct them even through uh, the use of force. Um, as you can see, the verse is quite complex, it's quite uh, articulated. And uh, in the first part, uh, the Quranic verse says that the husband, um, the men are in charge of women because God has chosen some of them over the others and because the men gives part of their wealth to maintain the women. This is interesting because in the contemporary legal discourse on female empowerment, um, uh, uh, Muslim women, uh, theo theo theologists and jurists and uh, economists, but mainly theologists and jurists, focus their attention on the fact that in this part of the verse, God itself creates a, a, a nexus between the fact that the man gives money to, to maintain the woman and the power that the man exercises over the women. And this contemporary, contemporary jurist and theologist uh, says since today uh, women in the Islamic world are much more independent, independent, they can work, they can gain money, they are able to live by themselves if, if they want, uh, this uh, verse should be read in a different way, should be considered as obsolete, should be considered as a trace of the past. Uh, 
uh, Islamic society no more uh, uh, fit with this description of the relationship between men and women. Anyway, this is what what the uh, uh, divine uh, voice said to humanity. In the second part of the verse, uh, God explains, as for those women whose disobedience you fear, admonish them, then leave them alone in their bed, then beat them. Now, the problem with this part of the verse um, it can be traced with reference to two specific terms. The first term is no shoes. In this case, you see, uh, I, I'm... When I give my lessons in Italian, I have some good translation of the Quran in Italian and I make reference to them. For this lesson, I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't go to the university and take um, um, uh, the translation in English printed. So, you know, uh, fruit of uh, a good reflection and stuff like that. I've taken some translation of the Quran available in internet. And that is why in this case, uh, you see the concept, you see no shoes translated as ill conduct, while um, I also found as a translation disobedience. No shoes, generally speaking, is the idea of the woman behaving not properly. Okay, you, you can understand then the concept like behaving not properly, not properly in the Islamic way of thinking what is proper for a woman to behave. And the second term, the second uh, word, which is problematic for the interpretation is the, uh, is the verb idrbukhuna. Idrbukhuna is the imperative tense of the verb darba. And in this case, the translation is discipline them and uh, the translator has added gently uh, in another translation that i have is beat them the problem with the verb uh, daraba is that its main meaning in arabic uh, makes reference to the use of force beat that, that that's it and usually uh, the, when you when you find the verb daraba in other context the main meaning of the verb uh, makes reference to the idea of, of uh, uh, beating um, in the contemporary Deborah, Deborah, yes. Yes. in this in this case uh, because this verse is, is you know uh, quite disputable one yes. and I guess especially in Turkey and it's a kind of taboo and we cannot discuss this 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 verse yes. and in this case um, it's taming uh-huh okay okay I mean in my view and yes. that somebody else um, may not be agreeing, yeah. uh, but in my in my not in, within my capacity and knowledge, it's it's taming. Yes, yes, yes. And in uh, in some other translation, I was looking in my my paper. Some other translation makes the accent on the idea that uh, even if daraba has as a main. Uh, meaning the idea of uh, beating or striking it has also the idea of separating and in uh, some some trans modern translators and some modern um, students of, of the problem um, suggest to understand this verb this order given by god as an idea of separate from your wife we will see it later but what is in interesting in, in this part of the lesson is to focus that while for centuries it was almost generally agreed that uh, this verse can be understood as a authorization for men to correct whatever the means to correct the wives together all over the islamic world as you said thank you to lie there is a discussion about the, the the real meaning of this verse also because uh, since the female are able to participate today in, in, a, in a very active way to the debate on the uh, on the meaning of uh, Quranic revelation, uh, especially female students, but also some men as followed this trend, have focused um, on the fact that in the Prophet Sunnah, in no case the Prophet has used violence against his wives or his daughters and even in the famous case of the prophet muhammad with aisha and the scandal of the necklace and the story that gave life to the revelation um about Kadf, the how do you say it in english the calumny of adultery even in that case where there were in an ancient perspective some reason for the prophet at least to be <laughs> irritated with his wife even in that case 
Prophet Muhammad does not beat his wife. So the modern, the modern scholars um, applying to this verse um, tend to focus on the fact that Quran should always, must, should always be interpreted in the light of the of the whole revelation and of the fact that in other part of the Quran, uh, well, when the Quran speaks about the ending of the marriage, talaq or divorce, it suggested uh, kindness and sweetness between men, uh, between husband and wife. And so the modern scholars said, how is it possible that while ending the marriage, you must behave with tenderness and sweetness. And while living inside the marriage, you can beat your wife and even kill her. There's something wrong in this kind of um, understanding the Quranic revelation. But nonetheless, this, this verse, as you said, is a problem because uh, the general idea that Muslim men are allowed by God to use violence against their women has created an attitude uh, not only in the Islamic society but also in Europe where the Muslims live that they are considered as um, ontologically devoted to violence because the religion authorized them to use the violence and there has been <clears throat> something like seven or eight years ago I don't remember exactly a case in Germany uh, uh, in front of a family court in German, there was a couple. She, both of them were um, comes from Morocco, but she was also citizens of uh, Germany. <clears throat> they get married. The wife beat the uh, the wife. The wife uh, went in front of the court asking for a quick procedure of divorce, which is possible in Germany in cases of domestic okay. violence. And the German and the German judge. Uh, replied to the wife, uh, sorry, it is not possible since you are uh, from Morocco, as your husband is, both of you are Muslims, and as you know, Muslim religion, author, Islamic religion, authorized the husband to beat the, the wife. As a consequence of this pronunciation in Germany, there was a great scandal. The judge was... Um, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, the, the question was taken from that judge and given uh, at the attention of the another judge who reversed uh, this sentence and said, no, this is a case of domestic violence and the religion is not important. But I gave you this example as a, as a demonstration of how deep is the idea that in the Muslim world, there is a Quranic verse that allows the use of violence uh, by men uh, toward women who belongs to his family or who are under his responsibility. Anyway, <clears throat> um, in general, among the Arab countries, um, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco does not make reference to the wife's duty of obedience, because in these countries there is a, a cooperation of men and women in, in the menage of the family, and um, they make reference to the mutual rights of women, uh, of uh, husbands and uh, wives. <clears throat> In other parts of the Islamic uh, world of Arab countries, as I said, there is still the idea that men is the head of the family. Uh, the first and most frequent case of disobedience cited by the legislators, where there is still the idea that a wife can be disobedient to a wife, is the case when the wife leaves the marital home without the authorization of the husband. And uh, the legislators make reference to the Sharia traditions and they allow the wives to leave the house um, if they exercise the right to visit their own relatives, their own parents, uh, or if they leave the house in case of emergency, emergency or in case of necessity recognized by the custom or by the law. Uh, if the woman wants to work, usually uh, there is um, a reference in, in the laws, especially in the Arabic Peninsula, uh, to the need for the work to be lawful. And in some cases, the legislator says the, the work must be lawful under a Sharia point of view. So not all the jobs are available for uh, the women. Uh, the courts see a hypothesis of disobedience, even in the case where the wife refuses to return to the a marital house or have left the house without a good reason once again according to sharia must be evaluated these good reasons or if they refuse without good reason to travel with the husband um, 
in in some cases in especially in uh, arabic peninsula where the legislator as i said before is quite conservative we can nonetheless find some provisions uh, that allows women to study so it is not usually it is not possible for the husband to prevent the wife from going to um, school or to the university but sometimes it is possible for the husband to pro to prevent the wife to go abroad to study because going abroad will interfere with the um, uh, housekeeping with the menage of uh, of the family now uh, i have to uh, exit from this powerpoint and then enter to the to the powerpoint uh, related to um, uh, domestic violence and honor crimes for just one second uh, okay, here we are. Condivido uh, schermo. Okay. Now, um, once again, uh, uh, honor crimes and domestic violence are not problem, uh, are not specific problem of the Arab world of or of the Islamic culture. What is specific of the Arab world and or of Islamic culture is the possibility in some case, as we have seen, to make reference to uh, the divine law to justify some behavior. While elsewhere, elsewhere, for example, in Italy, it was not possible uh, to make reference to religion. And when we used to uh, um, allow, we will see it later, uh, uh, some reduction of penalty in case of honor crimes, uh, this was a consequence of the patriarchal structure of the society when these laws were applicable. Now, uh, in the Arab world, uh, the idea of honor and shame are still today quite important. Um, usually, uh, there is not a there is not a, a, a right or wrong way of acting, but there is an honorable or dishonorable way of acting, and the people. Uh, children, women, men are taught uh, to act honorably, honorably uh, in order to avoid to give shame to the family as a consequence of their actions. Uh, usually you see uh, the relevance of honor and shame, especially in the society organized in uh, uh, group or tribes, but it is also possible to, to find the relevance of this concept uh, at the national level or uh, in contexts which are not organized uh, in tribes or uh, small groups. Um, the problem with the idea of honor and shame is that, as you can see here in the Arab world, there are two main words that make reference to honor. Uh, one is sharaf and the other is ird. Uh, sharaf makes uh, reference to uh, the tribe on the, or the family, and it um, it, it, it makes reference to a social status which is characterized by pride and dignity and this pride and dignity comes from a good reputation and the reputation is, uh, is uh, the result is a consequence of hospitality generosity and courage and uh, in, in this um, this idea of honor uh, is also um, the idea that uh, uh, sharaf can uh, upgrade or downgrade. Uh, it depends on how you behave. You can lose your sharaf, but you can also gain it later, for example, acting in a very um, brave way in a certain uh, circumstances. Ird is completely a different thing. Ird can be translated as a reputation, and it is all generally connected to the sexual behavior of women. Uh, Ird is considered as a measure to um, as a way to measure the female uh, purity it cannot fluctuate up and down like sharaf it can only uh, decrease if a woman has behaved in a way that is not proper and we will see what is a way not proper uh, she loses her and all her family members or the or the male member of the family lose sharaf as a consequence of the loss of her of the woman um, this this strictly connected idea that the sharaf of a man uh, depends from the ear of a woman is typical of patriarchal society you can see 
even if with different names, of course, this, um, this relationship between the honor of men and the behavior of women, almost everywhere, uh, the man has power on the, on the women, because this is a way to, um, to limit the freedom of women, to, to make them live in a very uh, controlled uh, life, uh, where they have to obey to so the males uh, of the family, the father, the brothers, the husband, the aunt, the cousins, whoever, but male. Now, um, the idea that the honor of the women, the ear of a woman, is um, an important element to, um, um, that contributed to define the sharaf of men, uh, is, is also one of the reasons why, uh, in this case in the Islamic world, but we can see something similar anywhere in the world, uh, why women uh, can be um, um, encouraged to behave in certain ways and to dress in certain ways. And um, you can see here two Quranic uh, revelation that are uh, used to, to express uh, the idea of Islam with reference to uh, morality or to chastity in particular. Uh, as you can see, the Quran admonished both men and women to guard their modesty and it used the same language, lower the gaze, men and women, guard their private parts, men and women. But in the case of women, there is something more. The women should not show their, uh, their beauties uh, the, the English tr translation, in my opinion, is not so good in this case because the English translation says they have not to show the adornment, it's not an adornment. In Italian, uh, the, the translation makes reference to the beauty of the woman, so the woman should... And, and even the reference to the beauty of women is not correct because the Arabic, the, the Arab word used here in the Quran Okay, now, let's go on. Um, uh, the problem with honor crimes is that honor crimes is connected to the idea that the woman has behaved in, an, in a not proper way under a sexual point of view. So the, the problem with honor crimes is that women can be accused of, be, of being Zania, and Zania can be an adulteress, but also a woman who has a sexual relationship um, outside the marriage within, without being married. And uh, the idea that the sexual behavior outside the marriage are prohibited by the Islamic law is behind uh, the idea that the, uh, 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 crimes committed to defend, to protect the honor violated by the sexual behavior is uh, possible. Um, so the, there is a strict connection between the, the patriarchy, the, the idea that the man is, is the head of the family, the idea that the sexual conduct can be punished if they don't respect uh, certain indication. Uh, there is sexual freedom inside the marriage, but outside the marriage in the Islamic legal tradition, uh, sex is not allowed. And um, altogether, these, these rules are the basis of the discipline of uh, uh, honor crimes. Uh, that's to say, the basis of the idea that if a man kills a woman who he is under his responsibility because she has behaved sexually in uh, a way that is improper, uh, he should be granted a reduction of penalty or, in some cases, an exemption from penalty. This is honor crimes. Honor crimes is a justification of a blood crimes by reason of honor. Your honor has been violated, has been um, injured, and you are allowed to repair this violation even by spreading blood. Um, we should just, just remember that in the Islamic legal tradition, even if zina is a crime, and as I said, it's a crime uh, uh, both the adultery and the sex outside the marriage, uh, this crime can be punished, should be punished, only if there is a specific proof. And the proof of, of zina is provided for by Quran, and Quran states that if you want to accuse someone of 
uh, having committed zina, you must have four witnesses. And in the Quranic, uh, in the Arab uh, world, uh, it is used the, fem uh, the, um, the male word. So there must be men, four men, uh, four witnesses. Uh, who, who must testify what? The four witness who must be Muslim, men, adult, uh, and uh, sane, uh, with uh, full uh, mental capacity, uh, must testify that they have seen sex. Uh, they have seen the actual union of uh, men and women in a sexual activity. It's not enough to say, I've seen Deborah together with Raniero speaking in a room. That is not sex. That is not Zina. Hmm? The fact that the Quran requires for witness and the doctrine will say, basing the reasoning on the Sunnah of the Prophet, that uh, the four witnesses can be substituted by four confession uh, by the person who has entered as Zina, uh, makes it clear that it is not so easy to punish someone for Zina, because if, if the lovers are, you know, not stupid, <laughs> they will try to have the uh, sexual relationship in a context where nobody can see them, especially because they are aware of the penal consequence of being caught in, um, in flagrante delicto. Anyway, uh, even if uh, the Quran makes a strict relation between uh, the crimes and the way of proving it. Uh, in the Islamic legal tradition, in the ancient legal tradition, we found a unanimity of the legal schools in exempting from punishment the husband, father, or brother who murders the wife, daughter, and sisters who are caught in the act of Zina. And as a consequence of this ancient attitude of the jurist, and this is explicable in the light of the, uh, of the reasoning we were uh, doing about Sharaf, Ird, and um, patriarchal society and the duty for the men to, um, uh, to control the behavior of the, the person who are subject to their authority. The consequence of this classical idea of uh, um, dealing with the, with the problem of honor crimes in the modern society, uh, uh, in the modern uh, Islamic society, in particular in the modern Arab society, we still have honor crimes. Now, we don't have time here to, to go deep into the example from Italian uh, penal code, but this is just an example as a comparative approach. Uh, honor crimes are not a problem. Uh, well, today, honor crimes are a problem mainly in the Arab world, but they used to be a problem also in Europe until some years ago. In Italy, for example, there exists the exemption, the, the exemption, there exists a reduction of penalty in case of honor crimes until 1981. That's to say it is only 40 years that in this country, in Italy, in my country, it is not possible to justify a murder because of honor. Until 1981, Italy was in the same um, uh, social environment as many of the Arab worlds, as well as other European countries. Of course, I've, I've taken Italy as an example, also because there is this nice movie that all, I think all the Italian students know. I don't know if it has been translated into other English, but if, if it has been, I suggest you to, to watch it because it's, it's funny while it's serious while funny. Anyway, we don't have time. Um, now let's go uh, focusing on the Jordanian uh, uh, situation uh, because it is a good example of what happens in the Arab world with the reference to uh, the, um, the discipline of honor crimes. Um, uh, provisions similar to Article 340 of the Jordanian Penal Code can be traced in other penal codes of the MENA region, in fact. Uh, you will remember who the Maharim are. Maharim are the persons who cannot be married because they are connected to the um, to the subject um, uh, by reason of blood, milk, or marriage. They are parents of the, the member of the family of the person. And uh, you can see here that the Article 340 takes uh, uh, into consideration two different um, uh, situation. Uh, the first one is the exemption from penalty in the cases of a man who, who catches his wife 
or one of his maharim committing adultery. If he catches the wife or the maharim committing adultery, and if he kills the woman together with the lover or anyway the woman, uh, the man is exempted from penalty. He will not be punished. Hmm? Instead, if he catches the wife, the female ascendants and descendants in what the Jordanian penal code calls firash uh, mashru, this is translated as unlawful bed. We can understand this idea as um, being involved in sexual activity that does not amount to adultery stricto sensu. Then in this case, if, uh, if uh, the man catches the wife, female ascendants and descendants, in flagrante delito, one lawful bed, there is a reduction of penalty. Um, what cannot be understood by those who study the, the rules about um, honor crimes um, is the reason of this difference. Why in one case uh, it is taken into consideration by the legislator or the full amount of maharim, while in the other case it is restricted only to uh, female, uh, to the wife and female ascendants and descendants. Um, uh, the Jordanian penal code, as you can see, granted a, um, a, a significant advantage, advantage uh, to the man who kills uh, other persons due to the fact that uh, they have behaved in a manner that is not proper in the social context and in the re religious context where uh, the rule uh, must be applied. Um, in, the, in the Jordanian history, it can be um, identified a trend in the application of these, these rules. And in particular, uh, Lama Buohode, who is a Jordanian scholar who now lives in the United States, has made a, a, a wide study of the jurisprudence of court of Jor Jordanian Court of Cassation. And she has found that uh, at the very beginning of the, of the life of the Penal Code of Jordan, um, the Article 98, which is a general rules about responsibility, uh, was not considered applicable to the crimes of honors. Uh, between 1953 and 1965, uh, the Court of Cassation uh, usually try not to apply not only Article 98, but also Article 340 uh, to, to the idea of honor crimes. Uh, then the, the situation started to change um, from 1964, uh, because the court here um, started to consider Article 98 as complementary to Article 340. And um, this has a, this attitude of the court um, has as a consequence that it was it became uh, easier uh, to save the defendant from the criminal responsibility for the murder of the of the women and or, and the lover or presumed lover. Um, the court um, reached the result of extending the application of Article 98 to the idea of honor crimes um, by making reference to the idea of fury and considering the fit of fury that you see here in Article 98 as always present in honor killings, as an element that is always uh, there when a man kills a woman uh, by reason of honor. Um, as a consequence, what used to be a distinction between an assault on the person of the defendant calling for the application of Article 98 and an assault on the honor of the defendant calling for application of Article 340 uh, collapsed. And uh, since 1964, an assault on honor, on honor became equivalent to an assault on the person. As a consequence of this, and why I'm entering into details in the case of Jordan, because the same attitude can be traced in other Arab country. And it is an attitude that shows um, a change of mentality um, in the society and in the judges that are expression of, of uh, that society. Um, when the Court of Cassation uh, started to uh, considering fit of fury applicable to the crimes of honor, uh, it, it also has the chance to to said that 
as you can see here, uh, if the defendant learns that the daughter has committed adultery, he is considered to have killed her in a fit of fury because of the act she has committed. The act, says the court, is an unrightful attack on the defendant honor, and it is dangerous for the defendant within the meaning of Article 98. That's to say that the fact that uh, the, child, the, the daughter or the sister of the defendant has had sexual assault the marriage is an assault to the defendant, as well as being attacked, for example, by a thief or a, a crazy man on the street or something like that. And in 1975, and these are this, this jurisprudence can be also traced uh, in uh, uh, more recent years. Um, uh, the Court of Cassation states that the adultery of the victim always is an injury to the honor of the offender. Uh, not, of course, there was a problem here for the courts in order to, to establish when the fit of fury, uh, how long the fit of fury can be considered as a uh, justification for the crime and in some cases as you can see here in the low part of the slide um, the court st states that two or three days uh, may not be enough for the for the man to gain serenity and calm down so uh, the father knows that the daughter has had a sexual relationship outside the marriage today he can wait three, but in some cases we see that the, co the court allows even 15 days. He can take at least 15 days of time and then he kills the daughter. And even if more than 50 days, 15 days have, um, um, hmm, separates the moment, divide the moment the father uh, was aware of the conduct and the, the moment the father kills the daughter, even in these cases, the court says there is no premeditation, but this is a fit of fury. And this attitude of the court shows how deep was the idea that the violation of honor in the Jordanian society should be considered a grave, a, um, um, a, 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 violent, a kind of violent crime committed by the woman against father or brother or, or husband and so on. Now, uh, of course, you can imagine that the Jordanian women have fought against this attitude of the law and of the jurisprudence toward the discipline of honor crimes. And um, uh, they have proposed in the last 20 years um, different uh, draft to the Jordanian parliament, uh, suggesting the, the changing of the wording of the code, suggesting the abrogation of the rules uh, on honor crimes, and facing in, uh, in this, um, in this uh, campaign uh, the hostility of some part of um, uh, Jordanian society. Uh, at the early, uh, in the early years of 21st century, um, a journalist, uh, Rana Husseini, she is Jordanian and she writes for Jordan Times. Uh, she has interviewed some members of the parliament, asking their opinion on the proposed draft uh, related to the honor crimes. And some of these members of the parliament, of course, not all of them, but it is interesting to see what kind of argument are used by, con by the conservative party of Jordanian society. One tribal leader uh, said, I'm quoting, a woman is like an olive tree. When its branch catches woodworm, it has to be chopped off so that society stays clean and pure. And a member of uh, Jordanian parliament, who is also um, a tribal leader, uh, says in an interview, once again, this is a quoting of uh, conservative parts of uh, Jordanian society. He says, when a man's daughter does a wrong, he cannot, the man cannot sing, uh, sit amongst men. He will be ostracized. They will not even give him a coffee. Who would like to kill his wife or daughter? Nobody. But if he does not, in a village or among a tribe, they will look down on him. They will, uh, they will avoid his company. And this is why the conservative part of, of Jordanian society has fought 
uh, a lot against the reform of uh, uh, the discipline of honor crimes. But at least uh, the, the, the movement succeeded in obtaining a little reform of, of the discipline. And as you can see here, uh, in, nine, in uh, 2011, uh, the Jordanian Penal Code was amended, and uh, any reference to the extinction of penalty and any reference to the Maharim uh, disappeared from the code. Now, uh, the only thing, thing that the uh, killer uh, can, can try to achieve is a reduction of penalty, not an exemption of penalty. Um, and what it is interesting is that in the, in the process of changing the rules on uh, honor crimes. Um, uh, it has been recognized even to women, uh, the idea that an ill conduct, a, a, a misbehavior, a sexual misbehavior by their husband um, is, um, is an injury to their honor. And as you can see here, it has been added a, a comma a paragraph to the article 340 that uh, grant the same excuses uh, to the wife uh, who surprised the who who surprised the husband having a sexual relationship um, with a woman but this ex this reduction of penalty operates only if uh, the husband has taken his uh, lover into the familiar house. Uh, that's to say that if the wife kills the husband because she sees him in the car, for example, having sex with a lover in the car, in that case, she will not be granted a reduction of penalty. Anyway, I'm not sure that I can, it can be considered an improvement, this kind of reform, uh, giving, allowing uh, the wife uh, a sort of compensation and the, the possibility to be justified if she kills her husband uh, in my opinion because i live in italy in, in 2001st century in my opinion it's not an improvement uh, a real improvement should have been uh, the definitive uh, cancellation abrogation of the rules on honor crimes nonetheless in the context of jordanian legal system and generally speaking, in the context of Arab world, this should be considered in any case an improvement, at least because there is no exempt, no more extinction of, exemption or extinction of penalty in case of men who murders uh, a female under their responsibility on the pretext, basing the uh, action on the pretext of um, uh, an injury to the honor. And connected to this, this argument uh, are some recent reform uh, in the field of domestic violence as you are well aware of domestic violence is a is a genus of the violence against women and uh, it is characterized by the subjects who are protagonists of this uh, of this violence, uh, given the fact that the victim uh, has a parental or emotional link uh, with the abuser. Uh, usually the domestic violence is committed by uh, a husband or a father or a brother, and uh, domestic violence um, in, can also be, can be represented by um, uh, act of physical violence, by sexual violence, by physical violence, and by what is called controlling behavior. And this is a problem uh, even in, uh, in the northern part of the Mediterranean region. Um, uh, the fact that uh, some men, not all men of course, but some men uh, consider their duty to limit uh, the freedom of the women they live, uh, they live with. Now, uh, in uh, in this century, in 2001st century, uh, some Arab countries have adopted laws uh, related to uh, the problem of violence against women. In particular, uh, Morocco and Tunisia have adopted broader law, a uh, law that are uh, connected with the violence against women in its uh, broader, broader, uh, broader meaning, sorry, and um, including also uh, the, the the problem of domestic violence. Uh, a limit of these uh, uh, broad laws of Morocco and Tunisia is that uh, uh, they miss the opportunity to, to prevent and to punish uh, not 
oh, well, they prevent and punish the violence against women committed by individual, but they don't take into consideration the violence perpetrated by the state um, uh, and the violence that occurs within a community to which the woman belong. Nonetheless, these laws can be considered an, an improvement uh, if compared to the previous situation that did not take, did not offer any instrument uh, to, to grant some more protection to women. All the laws uh, that we will examine, we will see examine, we don't have time to examine, but all these laws uh, have a part dedicated to uh, the, the so-called uh, prevention measures, uh, the possibility to uh, restrict uh, the freedom of the men to uh, come closer, come close to the women, and um, these laws offers the possibility for the state to create uh, a safe refugee for women victim of violence and uh, the, this kind of uh, problems, uh, so to say. Um, as you can see here, uh, an, an interesting point of uh, aspect of the Tunisian law uh, against uh, on the violence against women is that um, it, it, it makes violence against women as a, a matter of public concern. What does it mean, a matter of public concern? That unlike what happened in Morocco, uh, the withdrawal or complaint by the victim of the violence of, um, of, of the denunciation uh, has no longer uh, have the no longer has the effect of uh, stopping the investigation and furthermore uh, the women can apply to the court asking for a protection order against the husband even if she has not initiated a criminal proceedings or a divorce petition while in Morocco still today it is necessary for the woman to have um, initiated a procedure civil or penal procedure uh, that shows the existence of a problem between her and uh, the husband in order to obtain um, um, protection measure. Uh, other countries that in the uh, Arab countries that have adopted um, laws against uh, violence are Bahrain, Lebanon and Jordan. In, this, in these states uh, the laws are not against uh, um, are not related on violence against women but are related on domestic violence or family violence so they have a more restricted field of um, application. Uh, uh, the Bahraini case is interesting because Bahrain is the only member state of the Gulf Council cooperation uh, that have adopted a law against domestic violence. Um, a problem with these laws um, is that I, I, I go on with the, with the discussion um, is that when they have chosen to uh, to discipline the problem of uh, domestic violence, they have first, first of all described what they consider to be a family. And uh, you, you will see here uh, a, a list of members of the family who are taken into consideration by the legislator as possible authors or victims, it depends on the perspective uh, of the violence. Uh, these subjects are the subjects that can um, uh, taken into consideration by the judges when they have to discuss if we are in presence of a case of domestic violence or uh, a case of ordinary uh, violence, so to say. Uh, the definition of domestic violence are not excellent. Um, see, for example, the case of Jordanian law, crimes against person are domestic violence when committed by a family member against another family member. The problem with Jordanian law, we go back, is that um, the members of the family are those who belong to the family home, that's to say those who live in the same house. And this kind of definition um, uh, raises the question of whether it is possible or not to qualify as domestic violence, an act of violence committed against a spouse uh, who is not uh, cohabiting with the author of violence. Of course, we should give uh, the floor to the jurisprudence in order to, to clarify how we have to understand and to apply uh, these rules. Um, a peculiarity, uh, 
uh, peculiar attitude toward domestic violence has been shown by the Lebanese uh, legislator because um, uh, the, it's, a, it's quite strange law, the Lebanese one. Um, uh, the law defines the domestic violence as any act, omission, or threat committed by a family members against a, a member of the family. Okay, and uh, uh, they they make reference to the crimes listed in the law. Okay, you are you you commit domestic violence if you commit one of these crimes listed in the law against a member of the family. Who are uh, who? What are the crimes? listed by the Lebanese law. These crimes are begging, incitement to immorality, exploitation to prostitution, intentional homicide, and adultery. How can be adultery consider that domestic violence is beyond my capacity of understanding? Uh, why I say so? Because during the discussion related to the um, enactment of this law, um, there were proposed in front of the uh, Lebanese National Assembly some draft calling for the um, punishment of uh, the revenge porn, the punishment of stalking, uh, the punishment of uh, uh, abuse of means of correction. All these draft law, um, laws were not uh, followed uh, by uh, uh, official discipline by the National Assembly of Lebanese State, but uh, the legislator um, pretend to consider a case of domestic violence and the adultery, thus punishing this conduct, aggravating this conduct, if it is committed by, of course, a member of the family, because you have adultery only if your husband or your wife has betrayed you. So it's not, it's not possible to understand what is what has guided the hand of the Lebanese legislator in this case. And now a final consideration. Yeah. With, yes? Uh, excuse me. Would you like to excuse add? Excuse me, Deborah. Uh, I have to leave because I'm joining agenda. another meeting. But Marco yes. has joined and uh, she, she will uh, be coordinating the session. Okay. okay. Uh, so thank okay. you very much. See Ciao, Raniero. Thank you. Ciao. Occasion to share uh, uh, we have, uh, I don't know if someone is asking questions because I can hear a voice. No? Okay. Uh, I would like to close this. Uh, presentation with you, making reference to a very interesting case that has occurred in Morocco uh, last year, well, last year and a few months. Um, uh, it, it, this case refers to the possibility to punish marital rape, as maybe you know, the, the problem of marital rape is a problem almost all over the world, because all over the world it is difficult for a society and for judges to um, to accept the idea that in, inside the personal relationship between wife and husband uh, is possible to speak also of rape. Uh, this is a problem not only in the Arab world, but also in Europe and in other uh, juridical contexts. Um, uh, in, in the Arab context, uh, the problem is connected to what we have said at the very beginning of this lesson, the fact that it is considered a duty uh, for the woman to allow the husband to access her body for sexual relationship as a counterpart of the mahr she received um, uh, within the uh, marriage exchange, um, within the marriage contract. Uh, in, in this case, which is a leading case in the Morocco uh, legal tradition, and I think it will be, uh, it will operate also as a leading case in the Arab world, because what it is interesting in the Arab world is that uh, quite often, not always, but quite often, the judges uh, uh, look at what happened in, in the other Arab countries in order to be inspired in positive or negative by what happens in, uh, in uh, other legal contexts. So this is this must be considered a leading judgment, in my opinion. Uh, the the question that was behind this case um, uh, originated in, uh, in 2018, and uh, the case was uh, uh, the fact that a young woman went to the hospital showing signs of violence and bleeding from the. the the vaginal organs, and she accused the husband of having raped her and having deflowered her, having taken her virginity. As you can see here in the uh, Moroccan penal code, there are rules 
about rape and there are rules about rape uh, producing the loss of virginity uh, in the victim. So the woman went to the hospital and, and uh, declared that she has been raped by her husband. Uh, the case went in front of the first instance tribunal in uh, Morocco. And in this case, as you can see here, uh, the tribunal states that it is impossible to speak of rape in presence of a marriage certificate. Therefore, uh, the injuries that the, women, that the woman shows on her body, because there were injuries, uh, were um, considered as uh, assault and battery, as personal injuries uh, by the first instance tribunal. Uh, the wife, uh, appeals to the court of Tanger against this pronouncement and the court of Tanger gave this leading, in my opinion, this uh, leading judgment, which is quite interesting. And the court says that sexual violence occurs when the husband consummates a sexual relationship with the wife without her consent and under duress. Uh, this coercion can be physical, but can also be moral through back blackmail and threats or uh, by practicing sexual intercourse in a way that may humiliate the woman and violate her dignity. Uh, as a consequence of this approach to the, to the, to the question, uh, the judges stated that the rule in the penal code defining sexual violence as any act by which a man has a sexual intercourse with a woman against her will is inclusive of all women, included married women. And as a consequence, um, uh, the court uh, says that uh, the, the practice that recognizes uh, the right of sexual intercourse in presence of marriage should be repealed and states, as you see here, I have underlined, uh, the conjugal bond must guarantee the protection of wife and must not be used as a pretext to engage in sexual relationship against, uh, sexual relations, sorry, against the will of the wife. In my opinion, this is um, a leading judgment, not only because it's the, the first case in which uh, marital rape has been condemned, but it is a leading case also in the sense that it shows a changing of mind, a changing of attitude, at least in Morocco, but I'm sure this will spread all over the Arab world, um, toward uh, the construction of the relation between uh, men and women inside the family. If the man has no longer the right to rape the wife, he will no longer have the right to beat the wife, as we said before, and to limit the freedom of the wife and uh, whatever comes after this, uh, this attitude. So in my opinion, what can we, we and I'm closing my speech, what we have observed now looking at, at what happens on the southern side of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, is that uh, even though we have um, a strong bulk of uh, rules that dated back to ancient tradition that can be considered in a way a consequence of uh, uh, the um, power of Islamic legal tradition, uh, the societies are changing. Um, they are, um, they are changing in a, I would say in an autonomous way. I don't like, I don't like to think, and I think it's not correct to, to say that Arab world is changing because of the example that comes from, for, for example, from Europe. They are changing because they are changing this, the condition of the society inside the society. And what is interesting is that they are changing in the same way that we in Europe have changed in the in the last years uh, as well uh, as far as the woman I, I know that you have had the lessons about uh, the possibility for women to work in the main region as far as the women gain independence and uh, autonomy as far as they are allowed to uh, improve their knowledge to be scholarized they will um, uh, inevitably produce a change um, a need, of reform, need for reform in the uh, way the familiar relationship are considered by law. And this is an example. This is an excellent, in my opinion, this is an excellent example to, to take in mind. Now, I have more than consumed my time. I don't know if you have any questions or if you have any comments. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scholart, for this. Uh, Thank you, Marco.
uh, sorry for having late in this uh, in in this regard but uh, other commitments unfortunately other unforeseen commitments but thank you very much it has been very clear especially the last part related to lebanon and morocco i don't know if there are comments coming from our participants okay i'm the only participant <laughs> no, there, <laughs> thank you there, there thank you very much uh, it's been oh, my my first auditor thank you very much <laughs> so please yeah, nowadays um, everybody is over busy, you know, uh, yeah. to attend many sort of um, uh, yeah. things. So thank you very much, first of all, uh, Deborah, and it's really, really um, useful uh, knowledge uh, thank you. you gave us. And um, actually, I just but well, during your presentation, I just put my comments and the. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, questions on the chat box, but uh, I'm I'm sure you are so tired and you'll be busy, and I am extremely busy. Uh, one, just one question, and we can discuss yes. um, further um, um, after this meeting, exchanging emails. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm overjoyed to to know you because. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, research areas is overlapping, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm sure in the future we do something together. Anyway, what do you um, uh, are um, saying about um, Islam uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, practice, practiced in certain um, uh, part of the world, and also thanks to the a migration mm -hmm. uh, now islam is uh, being practiced in every um corner of the world nowadays yeah. and especially in the in the europe because yeah. uh people are uh when they are um going abroad or uh they are um if they are refugees or immigrants uh some people are getting uh more religious i guess anyway yeah. but <laughs> My point is, uh, as a person born in Istanbul, Istanbul is another story. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's not typical Turkish. City. There is Turkey and then there is Istanbul, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was born there, raised there, went to the university there, and uh, suddenly uh, God just put me in Antioch. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the place where I live, and I've been living here for 20, last 23 years. Wow. So I'm an immigrant internally. Um, and I realized um, Antakya, Hatta is a um, really um, um, different. It's a mosaic, you know. Um, uh, there are lots of ethnically uh, different, religiously different uh, people living in this um, part of the world. And also, I've been researching, uh, you know, I'm doing my research on them. Mm -hmm. And what I realized that, uh, because you talked about patriarchy, mm -hmm. regardless of what they believe here, yeah. here, and I know uh, Christians, I know um, Alevis, mm -hmm. I know Sunnis, I know uh, Armenians, doesn't matter. I think um, because uh of culture not religion yes uh they are um, uh, they are patriarchal yes. okay yes, true. and the patriarchy you just feel patriarchy everywhere yeah and it's, it's um and they say we we are different from each other when you ask a, a muslim people or a, is the islam practicing one um he or she probably it will tell you that oh we are different you know mm -hmm. but when you observe the way of living nothing is different yeah it's true it's true and nothing is different and a woman is woman is always the secondary position yes. Yes. so i think it's not the religion no of course religion makes them but it's it's not the religion, it's the culture itself. I absolutely agree with you. The difference that I can see is that uh, uh, there is culture at, at the origin of everything. Uh, in the case of Muslims, there is also the opportunity to use religion to just to justify a certain state of 
rules. Uh, while in other, for example, for Christians, uh, it, it can depend on what Christians, of course, but generally speaking, for Christians, it can be more difficult to use religion to justify certain rules. For Muslims, but also for Jews, it is more easier because they can find in, this, in the religious law some arguments that can be, I will say in Italian, piegato. How, will, how can I translate Marco piegato? They can be uh, they, they can, adapted. Yeah, they can adapt, but adapt yeah. is not the right, the, the, the right yeah. word. Adapt, uh, yeah, they can force. They, they can, can force, force, yes. They can yeah. force their religious rules in order to justify their conduct. But I definitely agree with you, Tulai. At, at the end of, at, at the beginning of everything is a cultural approach uh, to, to life and the, the fact that patriarchy, the, the, the distinction of rules of women and men uh, based on the fact that the men are stronger than women, that women must be in charge of children and so on, is a plug that is, is almost everywhere in the world. And in the Mediterranean area, it is definitely one of the major plug that the women have to face in their ordinary life. Thank you very much, Professor Scholard, for this. And thank you also to Lai for the, for the question. Uh, yeah. We will share, uh, I guess, all the information related with Professor Scholar email and contact. Yes, of course. Yeah. I've seen your, your answer. Maybe I will reply by email to Lai to your questions. But I agree with the idea that honor crime is not should be not the proper way to address the fact. Yeah, I agree. No, it's, it's, uh, no, yeah. no, oxymoron, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I, as a scholar, as a scholar, this is our duty That's to, to change the jargon, yeah. okay? Yeah. And if we don't change it, and we cannot expect this, uh, this Absolutely. from the others. Absolutely, you are right, you are right. Absolutely, I agree with you. Yeah. Yes, I have a last question, if I may, which mm -hmm. is related. Uh, Easy, please. <laughs> also, for the benefit of the colleagues that will follow in uh, online in uh, mm -hmm. a synchronous way, uh, will you say that it is easier for Muslims and 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 Jews for to to find the justification in this regard in uh, in in, um, in sources? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. in my in your view, uh, what are the main sources, especially in, in Islam? Uh, that are uh, um, forcing or are uh, misogynous with regard to, uh, to women. I mean, in your view, when they are trying to justify, uh, when Muslims uh, are trying to justify these acts against women, they are using more the, the Quran or more, or they are searching in the Sunnah and uh, the Ahadith, hmm. the, it's in the narration. Because, yes. This is a good question. In, in my experience, Please. Uh, of course, it's not a... In my experience, I, I have noticed that almost, almost all of these conservative scholars start from the Quran, and then if they don't find enough instruments in the Quran, they move toward the Sunnah. But almost all of those that I have uh, read, almost all of them start from the Quran, and almost all of them start from the... Uh, we have spent some time on commenting yes. the Surah 434. Almost um, all of them start from the idea that Quran Allah placed the men on uh, on top of women. Above, yeah. yeah, above the women. Yeah, most of them the conservative. And what is interesting is is uh, reading uh, how Muslim scholars, men and women of Muslim scholars, who are um, um, who who wants a, a different approach to, toward the, the, the holy book, read the, sa the same uh, verses in a different perspective. This is, this is quite interesting, uh, making an analysis, analysis on the um, semantic meaning of the single terms, uh, making a, a, a wide interpretation of the holy book, uh, reading the sunnah, looking for arguments that sustain the liberal attitude of the prophet toward the women, which are definitely present. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting because I think, maybe so I can correct me, I don't know, but I think that the, the, pro the problem, the, the topic of women rights in, uh, in the MENA region, in the Islamic world in general, in MENA region in particular, is the topic today. Yeah. It, 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 it is the topic. You, yeah, cannot, I see your point. you cannot improve the site if the women cannot participate in the site. That's it. Yeah. 
Definitely. Uh, one one last thing, one last thing Please. before we go. Um, actually, um, you 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 said you know you put aside Turkey every time you 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 uh, yes, are because talking. Of, yeah. But if there is a big but, because yes, okay, it's a, a secular country, so called. Uh, however, it's um, uh, the jury and the de facto cases. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's another uh, uh, it's another story, okay? Yeah. And the they, they in the uh, yeah, okay. One law says something. Law, sorry, yeah. law says something, yeah. but the daily life says it's another yeah. thing. Yeah. And yeah. it's the daily life, uh, the, the the who um, of which women uh, are suffering from. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for your um, you. for your um, annotazione for your uh, observation. Comments yeah, comments. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's true. It's true. Uh, so, if there are no other questions, I can stop the registration. Thank you very much for for your time. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope to. I've been clear enough to totally express totally. my idea. <laughs> totally clear. So. I just interrupt the... Thank you.